And Deborah ISS, this is Houston. Are you ready for the event? We're ready. University of Arizona, this is Houston. Please call Endeavor ISS for a voice check. Hi, this is Mike Drake at the University of Arizona. Can you hear me? Yeah, Mike, we got you loud and clear. Welcome aboard. We're on board the Japanese module on the space station right now. Well, as you can hear, there's a lot of applause in the room. Um, we have a lot of different people here today. Um, we have staffers and friends from your wife, Congressman Gabby Gifford's office, who are with us. We have a number of first responders from the fire department that are with us. Uh, most importantly for us, I think, is we've got a lot of middle school students who are going to be the ones asking you questions. And uh, we also have a number of, of University of Arizona Space Grant students which uh, your wife Gabby has been very strongly supportive of, a great program at NASA. So let me get right to it. Um, I appreciate you taking time tonight, Mark, and your two colleagues. Do you want to introduce the other two colleagues with you so that the people in the audience know who they are? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, to my right, your left, is our pilot, Greg, Greg Johnson, uh, Air Force Colonel, just retired. And on my left, your right, Ron Guerin, who is the U.S. Segment Commander of the International Space Station. He's been on board here about, what, seven weeks now? Great. Thank you very much. Let me bring up our first middle school student. I'm going to ask her to say her name and ask her question. Hi, my name is Lena Ariaga from Gridley Middle School. My question is, what feeling did you have when you first looked out the window? Well, let me, let me first say, you know, for everybody there, welcome aboard the space station. It's a great opportunity for us to have a chance to talk to the folks there back in Tucson. I know I probably know some people in the in the office. We can't see you, uh, but, you know, it's, uh, it's nice to have the opportunity to do this event. We just got up. I imagine you guys are getting ready to go to sleep this morning um, with regard... Uh, or this evening. With regards to your question, though, for me, when I first saw the Earth, it was over 10 years ago. I very distinctly remember it. I was the pilot on the same space shuttle that's docked just a little bit to out that hatch and to our left, Space Shuttle Endeavor. And at Mach 15, when you're going into orbit, the space shuttle rolls the he uh, to heads up. So it's upside down and it rolls heads up. And I looked over my right shoulder out the window. You could see this big blue planet out there. And it's really like, even though it was 10 years ago, it's like it was yesterday. Very, very spectacular view. And it's pretty exciting to get to go into space. I'm going to add Thanks. to that answer uh, only because uh, uh, I experienced um, my uh, first daytime liftoff about a week and a half ago. And uh, to my left was Commander Kelly, and I was the pilot in the right seat, just like uh, Mark was recalling t from 10 years ago. My first flight was three years ago, and it was at night. And so uh, this past launch was my first day uh, launch as well. And uh, looking over my right shoulder, I was amazed at how uh, the Atlantic Ocean accelerated by. Uh, I do recall looking out the window, and Mark said, focus. Because uh, as the pilot, I'm supposed to focus on the engines and the other systems. But I was amazed at what it looked like out the window. So I just wanted to share that with you. Thanks so much. It's nice to know you're human as well as you're highly talented and trained. Next question. Please say your name. Hi, I'm Alex Boland. And do you have to tie everything while in space or during liftoff and landings? Hi, Alex. Uh, yeah, we, we really do. When, uh, on launch, everything vibrates uh, um, and shakes, and so everything has to be tied down. But then once we get to orbit, it, you know, it's not shaking and vibrating anymore, but if we don't tie it down, it'll float away. So, uh, you know, one of the big challenges living up here is um, not losing your stuff. So we, we have to um, keep things tied down, keep things secured, because, um, 
you know, you'll lose it pretty fast. But that, you know, that becomes challenging, but it also becomes fun, too. So if you're eating a meal and, uh, you know, you have a, a couple of things in your hands, if you, if you run out of hands, you could just take your, your food and, and stick it right there and then uh, go about, go about uh, you know, getting a drink or something else and then just grab it and there it is. Okay, just like that. So, <laughs> so it's, uh, you know, it's challenging on one hand, but it's a lot of fun on the other. Sounds like very convenient and better than growing another arm. <laughs> Next uh, student, please. Say your name. Hi, my name is Bailey Bishop from Gridley Middle School. My question is, how are you adjusting to zero gravity? Yeah, I think the first time you fly into space, it takes a while to get used to it. You know, there's no up and down anymore and it's hard to manage your stuff and the fluid shifts in your body so you you don't you don't feel too well the more you do it the easier it gets it seems like for me this is my fourth flight and it seems like my body remembers what this is all about and understands it and i, I can get adjusted quicker space station crew members tend to say it takes about a month till you're really adjusted on orbit i've never been in space for a month at a time so i, I can't really comment about that. Thank you. And the next question. Okay. Hi, my name is Mia Birch from Gurley Middle School. My question is, why do you take dry food with you and can you eat regular meal in space or is it impossible to keep the food from floating off? Well, we have uh, Velcro attached to all our food items. Mark just grabbed, looks like some dried fruit of some kind, pineapple. Uh, dried pineapple. We have a lot of dehydrated foods like uh, dehydrated uh, pineapple, and uh, we have other items that come uh, prepackaged already to go, and they're in uh, packets that we just put in the oven and, and, and heat. We also have uh, clear packets, uh, plastic packets, that we inject water in to rehydrate them. Um, and, and, and every meal is, is fun. So uh, uh, it, it's really easy to eat, and uh, the food is great. Uh, some people love the shrimp cocktail. I actually prefer... Uh, the M&Ms, and uh, it's 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 a normal diet. I made a hamburger the other day. Uh, since it's zero gravity, I was able to stick a tortilla on a clip, put a little ketchup and mustard. It doesn't go anywhere, and then I stuck the the hamburger patty right exact right on the ketchup, and it stuck uh, because of course gravity's not acting on it. And after I took it off the clip, I rolled it up and ate it. So uh, we have pretty much normal foods, no soda pop or things like that. Thank you. That looks like fun. Next question. Okay. Hi, my name is Alex Enriquez from Gridley Middle School. My question is, how long does it take to readjust when you get back to Earth? Well, Alex, that's a good question, and a lot of it depends on how long you've been up here. Um, for shuttle crew members that are up here for maybe two weeks or so, uh, the, adjust, the readjustment is, is pretty quick. Um, maybe a few days. Uh, I remember on my shuttle flight about three years ago, I think it was um, probably a day or two before I could walk without thinking about it. And I remember when I first got back, I would take a, a step and go, okay, there goes the left foot, there goes the right foot. I'm starting to lean left. I need, I need to lean back right. And so, but that, that passed very quickly. Um, for, sh for station crew members who are up here, you know, maybe six months, the rehabilitation is much longer and um, some of the things that we do to help pre prevent or, or to, to make it so that when we get back we don't have such a big re adjustment period is exercise and we do two hours a day of either resistance rec exercise like weightlifting or uh, aerobic exercise like riding the bike or running on a treadmill and that really seems to help. It, it helps us uh, in our adjustment when we come back to Earth and it also helps uh, 
uh, prevent some of the or, or slow down some of the processes of just living in space, like losing uh, some of our uh, bone mass and uh, our muscles weakening and things like that. So it, it helps to counteract that. Uh, so there's a big, uh, long period of time uh, after we get back uh, where we slowly, uh, you know, do a lot of exercise and a lot of other uh, activities to, to readjust to gravity once we get back. Okay, now next question from... My name is Shay Bushy, and I'm from Mid Gridley Middle School. My question is, how do you sleep in space? Well, you, you know, you could sleep just kind of floating around. The problem with that is you'd bump into you, to other people and you'd wake them up. And then you might not have any idea where you're going to um, go to on the space station. It's a really big place. So what we do is we sleep in a sleeping bag. It has a bunch of straps and hooks, and you can tie it to the ceiling or to the floor or the wall. Uh, last night, I slept on the floor of the flight deck of the space shuttle. Uh, Mike Fink, one of our crew members, was sleeping on the wall downstairs, and sometimes people will sleep on the ceiling. It takes a while to get used to sleeping in zero gravity. There's no pressure on your body. My first night in space... 10 years ago, I got in my sleeping bag and then I immediately rolled over on my side like I would in bed and then thought to myself, well, this is kind of dumb because there is no side, because there is no up or down. So you might as well just stay in the position you're in. Thank you. Oh, do you have last year? Hi, my name is Kirsten Bassett, and I'm from Grid Gridley Middle School. My question is, how is growing plants in space different from growing them on Earth? Right, Kirsten, that's a really good question because we're actually doing that. And uh, you know, uh, we're trying to figure out the answer to that question, really, and, you know, what effect gravity has in how plants grow. And one of the things we're trying to do is remove, because we're in, in space and because we're in this what we call microgravity environment, we can eliminate uh, gravity from the equation. And we can uh, see how plants grow without gravity. And that helps us to better understand the process of plant growth, which helps us uh, understand how crops grow and how we can make more food. And so one of the things that we're doing is we're looking at what factor gravity plays in uh, a plant's growth and how that compares to things like uh, moisture in the soil and, and um, uh, chemicals that, that are used for fertilizers and, and things like that. And, you know, a lot of the research that we do is so that we can go farther and farther into space. And, you know, when we go uh, to Mars and beyond, you know, we're going to have to grow our own food in order to do that. And so that's a very important part of the research that we do up here. But you know, on the one hand, we're, we're trying to discover how to go further in space, but we're also helping, uh, you know, all the people on Earth as well as we grow, uh, you know, fi figure out how to grow crops in, in areas that are stricken with drought and, uh, you know, areas that don't have uh, really good soil. And so there's a lot of uh, experimentation that we do to look at the, the effects of gravity. And we also have, you know, cameras on the space station that look at crops uh, throughout the world and, and evaluate how they're growing over time so that we could um, better understand that process. So very good question. Thank you. Hi, my name is Nora Thompson from Goodley Middle School. And my question is, how can you create gravity on the space station? If you've watched any uh, science fiction movies, uh, you might have seen rotating uh, spaceships, large rotating spaceships. And that would really be the only way uh, that I can think of to uh, artificially create gravity. We really don't know exactly what gravity is. Uh, so that's one of the problems. But we do know that by rotating a large object, we can create the sensation of gravity. Now, the space station, although we're pretty much uh, stationary uh, in space with relative to the Earth, so we feel pretty much zero gravity, we are slowly rotating as we orbit the Earth every 90 minutes. 
And so uh, one of our uh, uh, fellow comrades, an Italian astronaut, he can actually sense that uh, feeling where one side of the space shuttle has just a little bit of a drift up and, uh, and way at the far end of the Russian side, it has a little bit of a drift down as we gradually uh, rotate around the Earth. So um, I, I would say we possibly are experiencing that now. Some of us don't necessarily believe that's true. But uh, if you really rotate the vehicle uh, quickly, we'd be able to kind of have an artificial sense of gravity. Hi, my name is Emily Jonathan from Gridley Middle School. My question is, what do you do with the waste in space, and how do you recycle in the shuttle? Now, space shuttle mission's only about two weeks long. We're going to land on flight day 17, so we bring home all our garbage. It gets recycled on the ground. We separate it a little bit just because of areas. We, we, we want the wet stuff together and the dry stuff in a different spot. Uh, but on the space station, they've got a bigger garbage problem. So I'm going to turn that over to Ron. Maybe he's got some comments. Well, um, s some of the garbage, like just the, the, the things that we make, like packaging material and uh, leftover food and stuff like that, we actually have cargo ships that come up uh, and deliver uh, goods to us. And then when they go back to the Earth, they actually burn up in the atmosphere. And so before they leave, we, we pack them full of as much garbage as we can. But on a space station, you know, it's very, very expensive and very difficult to bring up supplies. So whatever we can produce ourselves, uh, we want to do that. So water, for instance, it's very difficult to bring up water. So the water that we have, we want to use over and over again. And so uh, when we go to the bathroom, the urine that, that um, is captured by, our, by our, our toilet, basically, is recycled. And um, some of the condensation in the air uh, that the air conditioners capture capture is also um, recycled and then we drink that. So it's a it's an interesting process and again, you know, when we go farther and farther in space, we're not going to be able to launch with as much water as we'll need to go to, to Mars for instance. So we'll have to recycle that. Hi, my name is Leo Varelis from Grizzly Middle School. My question is why are the space shuttles and space stations so white? Do you mean, like, why is it the space shuttle white on the outside? Yeah. Yeah, I, I really, I don't know. I uh, imagine it has to do with, um, you know, when we designed it, early on we designed um, spacecraft and we made the, the Saturn a white rocket. It certainly could be a different color. When you're outside of the Earth's atmosphere and in the sun it gets really, really hot and in the shade it gets really, really cold. So I imagine because of the thermal properties and the need to reject heat inside the space shuttle, we also have a lot of electronics that make heat. So you want the outside to be a little bit on the cooler side so you don't have heat buildup. So that's probably why we chose white as the color. Uh, if you notice black pav pavement there in the summer, especially in Tucson and in Arizona, where it gets really, really hot, that stuff is a lot hotter than the white stuff. So white would be a good choice. The space station actually isn't white on the outside. Uh, a lot of the panels are aluminum. Part of the Russian segment is kind of white. It's got solar arrays that are orange. Uh, sometimes they look a little bluish and some radiators. So the space shuttle's more multicolored. Uh, the original ET was white. Yeah, we also made the original external tank we painted white. And I don't think we had even a good reason to do that. Eventually, we took the paint off to save weight. It was about 1,000 pounds, I think, of weight. And now it's orange. Hi, my name is Amanda Duncan from Goodley Middle School. My question is, can you see signs of man-made or natural di disasters from space? Uh, 
Uh, Amanda, you can, and uh, you know that's one of the the um, really good things about being up here and having this vantage point to see the to see our planet from. And uh, one of the most recent ones is the flooding in the Mississippi River, and we were able to take pictures of that and kind of document over time the changes to the river and uh, the effect in the surrounding communities. And so, you know, volcanoes, hurricanes, uh, pollution, all those type of, uh, of um, you know things that are affecting our environment, you know, we can monitor, we can watch, uh, we can keep track of up here. And it's uh, really interesting to see that and to see um, the good things and the bad things and see how, you know, man-made effects uh, on our planet uh, are, are making some changes that, are, that some of them good and some of them bad. So it's good to keep track of that. And it's a, it's a wonderful place to do that from. My name is Jessica Luna from Gridley Middle School. My question is, what is a typical day like on the space shuttle? Well, uh, a typical day on the space shuttle is we all have a particular wake-up time. Right now, our wake-up time is about 12 hours shifted away from yours. We just woke up, and you're probably starting to think about going to bed tonight. Uh, once we get up, we have a couple hours to ourselves where we shower, brush our teeth, shave. We get something to eat, get a cup of coffee, although it's not really a cup. It's more like a bag like this. And then, uh, and then we look at our schedule for the day. On the space station, they have, they're given a schedule. We're also given a s schedule on the space shuttle. And we do our various tasks. They might be spacewalks. They might be um, filling a water bag. Uh, they might be um, operating the robotic arm. Or it might be uh, moving water from one place to another. But we have various tasks. They allow times for meals. They allow times for exercise. And then prior to sleep, we have another couple hours that we can kind of get our, our stuff together, get a little free time, look out the window. And then we go to bed. On the space shuttle, most of our schedule is very, very regimented and, and structured and busy for the entire time we're here. We kind of compare it to like a sprint. Uh, a fast running race. Whereas on the space station, and I've only heard, I've never been assigned on the space station, uh, because they're going a little bit longer duration, I think they do get a few uh, weekend days off now and then. Uh, with just Ronnie here, I'm sure he's not going to get as much time off as he wants. But they view that more as like a marathon. And so that's pretty much a typical day in space. Hi, my name is Chris Kreisick from Gridley Middle School, and my question is, do you exercise or run in space? On the space shuttle, we have a bike, and I'm actually scheduled to ride the bike here in a few hours. Helps us not lose as much bone mass and, and be more adjusted for entry, which for us is actually just a few days from now. On the space station, they've got a, more options. They have a treadmill with, with some straps to give you some gravity, so you're strapped to the treadmill. Uh, there's also a bike, and there's a resistive exercise device, which allows you to lift weights in space. There are, there's, nothing has any weight, but this device seems pretty much like you're lifting weights, like at a gym. So there, there are options on the space station. And like Ron said earlier, the space station crew members are assigned to exercise about two hours a day. So after six months, when they get back, they're not in too bad of shape. Hi, my name is Taylor Reynolds from Gridley Middle School. My question is, how does the human body change in space, both long and short term? Well, you know, the human body is, a, is an amazing thing, and it really adapts very quickly to uh, any environment that it's in. And, you know, very quickly after you get to space, your, your body starts to, to adjust. And, 
that's a good thing, but but some of that some of that adjustment is not that good. So one one of the things that your body realizes is it doesn't really need a skeleton anymore, and so you start losing a lot of the the mass in your bones, the density of your bones. Um, you don't need the muscles in your legs as much, so you start to lose those. Um, as Mark said, the fluid shifts. So in your body, there's fluid that is all kept towards your feet because of gravity. So once you get to space, that uh, is is free to flow to different parts of your body that it normally doesn't. So those are all changes uh, that occur. Your eyes change shape. Uh, so there's a lot of these different effects that, that occur uh, as your body tries to adjust to its new environment. And uh, like we had talked about before, so, you know, some of these bad effects, like losing bone density, we have to counteract uh, uh, through other means like exercise. So. Um, like I said, the, the body is an amazing adaptive uh, um, thing, and it's, it's you know, something that uh, we study up here a great deal. We have a lot of experimentation that we use, uh, that we do on ourselves and, and on each other as crewmates. And, um, you know, we're, we are learning more about the human body uh, with our time up here. Hi, my name is Jonas List from Gridley Mill School. My question is, what is astronaut training like? It uh, varies a little bit between the space station and the space shuttle, actually pretty significantly. For a space station crew member, you're training to be on an expedition for a very long period of time and op operating different laboratories aboard the space station, as well as the space station systems that keep you alive and recycle urine into water like Ron was talking about. Uh, on the space shuttle, it's more like, I mean, it's a ship, more like a, maybe a ship at sea, but an airplane, the combination of the two. It has environmental systems for life support, but it also has the systems that an airplane would have, as well as a robotic arm to do robotic arm operations. The space station has this as well. So we've got to learn about the systems, uh, and we've got to learn how to operate them really well, particularly on liftoff and landing. It's very dynamic environment. Things can happen very fast. Things can break. So we spend a lot of time in space shuttle simulators practicing to handle things when they go wrong. So Greg and I here have spent probably thousands of hours in, in the space shuttle simulator uh, during liftoff and landing. Uh, for the space shuttle, we also have to practice landing it. We practice spacewalks. Uh, we had uh, three of our crew members do four spacewalks over the last week or so. They spent a lot of time uh, in a very large pool in the spacesuit that provides some neutral buoyancy, so it's similar to the spacewalk. We practice robotic arm operations. We're in a classroom, kind of like uh, you guys might be at your at your middle school. So it's it's very varied. It's a and it's really really a great job. Okay, Mark. I'm told we have time for one last question. So uh, here's the last one. Hi, my name is Maddie Shaw from Gridley Middle School. My question is, how do you shower in space? Well, thanks, thanks, Maddie. Um, we don't have a shower. Uh, Skylab, after the Apollo program where we went to the moon, actually had something that was like a shower and I think worked pretty well. On the space station and space shuttle, we don't. So we take a bath kind of like like somebody would if they were in a hospital bed, I mean, with a towel and water and soap on it. You rub it on yourself, and then you, 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 you wipe it off later. So it's not the greatest shower, uh, but, you know, it works. It works for two weeks for us, and it'll, it'll work for six months for Ron. Um, so that, that, that's a very good question. Before we go, I wanted to congratulate the University of Arizona on their new project, and I can't remember the name of it. We just saw it in the news since we've since we launched on the on the 16th of May. But their project to visit an asteroid. That's uh, you know very exciting. It's I think one of the biggest uh, NASA related projects that a university has had. And so I wanted to congratulate. 
uh, the University of Arizona for, for, for you know for that milestone in their in their exploration of space. So thanks very much, everybody. It was great talking to you today, and uh, hope to uh, see you in Tucson. Thank you, Mark. Let's all applaud their work up there. We're going to fly out of the way here. Bye, Mark. <laughs> Safe travels. <laughs> You're welcome. Endeavor ISS, this is Houston ACR. Thank you. That concludes the event. Thank you, University of Arizona and participants.